Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, praise the Lord, friends. And uh, let's uh, pray a little bit more. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for yet another day of calling upon your name, another day of looking up to you, another day of seeing your wonders amongst us. We thank you for your love, for your mercies that are new every day. We now speak concerning our fellowship this morning in the name of Jesus. We release the anointing that breaks yokes in the name of the Lord. We rebuke every scheme of the evil one that seeks to disrupt us. Yes, I speak to everyone under the sound of my voice in the name of Jesus, that I will be stirring up within their spirits right now. They will awaken to their awareness that you desire to speak to us, that you desire to inspire us to a new level. Father, I pray that in wherever they are right now, there will be a stirring up within their spirits, an unction within their spirits to pray, to connect with you, to have an expectation in their spirits for the day and for this season. Father, we thank you for your doing great things amongst us in this season, and you desire to have vessels, to have people, instruments, that you will work through, O oh Lord, to extend your kingdom to greater levels. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We speak the blood of Jesus. Yes, we speak the blood of Jesus. We speak the blood of Jesus over every family represented on this call this morning, that the blood of Jesus will clear every scheme the evil one had fashioned against them. Yes, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you honor. We give you praise. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. You're very welcome once again. My name is Peter Mutwazeje. Um, it's another great opportunity for us to share in the word. And uh, I want to thank uh, our leaders for these opportunities uh, that we have had uh, for quite some time now. Uh, indeed, like our sister has indicated, uh, our topic this morning is conquering to advance the gospel. Conquering to advance the gospel. It's a series within uh, these 40 days of prayer and fasting. Today is the 20th, and we continue to, to wait on the Lord as he empowers us to go to greater heights. And uh, our scripture, our reference scripture is Philippians chapter 1, from verse 12 up to 14. Maureen, uh, if you don't mind, kindly confirm to me that you can hear me well. Yes, we hear you very well. All right. So I will read uh, uh, our text for today, which is Philippians chapter 1, from verse 12 to 14. Uh, using the New Living Translation version. It says, And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has happened to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. <laughs> this is uh, Paul writing to a church he had uh, started in Philippi and uh, records indicate that most of these letters were written when he was in prison. And this particular one, yes, indeed, he alludes to it, he's in prison. But he is testifying and encouraging the, the church that his being in prison is actually working wonders concerning the extension of the kingdom of God. Yes, he says, everyone, including the gods, <laughs> they now know Christ. 
they now know that I'm in chains because of Christ. And uh, even the believers around there, once they learned about this, they, become, they became more confident and bold about speaking uh, about the message of Christ. Now, please allow me to, to, to do a small introductory exposition, just a preamble before we get into the details of this sharing. And, uh, you know, many of us might be familiar with the phrase, the fivefold ministry of the church. The fivefold ministry of the church. It's, it's mainly derived from Ephesians chapter 4, uh, from verse 11 to 16, and I'm going to read it. It says, Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11 to 16, but I may not read up to 16, but from verse 11, it says, Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Verse 12 says, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. All right? So, in this scripture, we see uh, Jesus giving gifts to the church, and they are listed, and there are five, uh, five of them. And so, in, in, in many cases, they refer to this list as the fivefold ministry of the church. In short, we, in the church, you would expect some apostles, you would expect some prophets, or at least people functioning in the office of the prophet, you would expect evangelists in that church, you would expect people functioning in the, in the office of pastors and also of teachers. Actually, the, another version says, it was he who gave gifts. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers, he did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. So, <laughs> it's interesting that the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers should equip the church, should equip us, should equip me and you so that we do the work, all right? <laughs> it's us to do the work. They equip us, we do the work, and we build up uh, the body of Christ uh, uh, to the level that Christ wants it to be. Now, again, I'm just doing a small preamble. In a big church like All Saints, we are blessed to have a number of, of priests and lay ministers that are gifted differently. So you'll find one, one will function more as a teacher and another more as a pastor. And uh, not everyone, for example, can do Sunday school. You need a teacher for Sunday school. <laughs> you need someone who functions in that office as a teacher for Sunday school. Not necessarily because they are trained as teachers, but there is grace upon them to teach. And not everyone can do, for example, you know, marriage counseling. You, you need a, someone functioning in the office of a pastor, more or less, to do counseling. And so others function more as uh, in the prophetic and, and so on and so forth. Yes, again, some can even operate in more than one office. You find he's an evangelist, yet he, he operates in the prophetic uh, but also he's a great teacher of the word. Yes, they are, they are diff it's okay. I mean, you can cut across offices. But there is an office. There is an office that we have not fully appreciated. Among these five, there is an office that I think as a church we have not fully appreciated. The office of an apostle. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> this, is a, this is a small introduction to this message. The office of an apostle or the ministry of an apostle. All right? And I, I will shed some light before, before we, we move on. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 28, it says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, the helps, the administrators, and various you know, kinds of tongues, EDC, EDC. But on the list, it says first apostles, and, uh, and I'm not proposing that the way the, 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 these offices are listed in a way is to show that one is more uh, important than the other. But I think there is some order in which one feeds into another. So we seem not to have fully recognized the office of an apostle. We have accepted the illusion that apostles are no more, you know, apostles, the 12 apostles of Christ, whilst those ones went, and we, 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 we don't seem to recognize this office. But this morning, I, I want to base what we're going to share on this. That, you know, this view that assumes that there are no more uh, apostles or the office of an apostle, it, it limits... The, it limits the apostolic office now only to the, you know, the way they wrote the gospels, the writing of the inspired witness of the gospel. We limit the role of the apostolic ministry to missionary work. You know, apostles are like missionaries, yes, and then they go to areas where the gospel has not been preached. That's the context in which we look at it. We are so reluctant to recognize the office of an apostle. An apostle. If I introduced myself at All Saints Cathedral that I'm an apostle, I know that would have, there would be a bit of murmuring in the congregation. We easily recognize the office of pastors when they say, you know, how oh, I wish I could find some names on this call for purposes of illustrating my point. Uh, yes. I'm looking for a gentleman. Aha. Uh -huh. I have the okay, I've seen my former boss, David Mutaka. <laughs> if I if I introduce Pastor David Mutaka to speak to you, you have no trouble with that. If I introduce a uh, uh, teacher, let me look for another one. Eunice, Eunice, Eunice uh, is common on this forum. Good morning, Eunice. If I introduce the teacher of the word, Eunice Naziri, there will be no problem. If I introduce evangelist, uh, evangelist, let me pick another one quickly. Uh, uh, I have seen our, our <laughs> head of lady and uh, rightfully this title fits her. If I introduce evangelist, Kedres to the agenda. Everyone would not doubt, would not question anything. But if I introduced Prophet uh, Peter, <laughs> there would be a there would be a mama. If I introduced Apostle um, Mike, I see Mike Rukwago. If I oppose, I, I introduce Apostle Mike Rukwago, people would begin to think, mm, when did this start? So we perceive it as prideful or, or boastful when anyone calls himself a prophet or an apostle. Yet, apostles, let me tell you, apostles have a duty. Apostles have a primary duty to extend the borders of the kingdom of Christ by preaching the gospel to all nations. Now, apostles are gifted to be the most effective church planters, you know, people who plant churches. Now, please understand, church planting is not necessarily creating another church. <laughs> uh -uh. And not all churches are as a result of apostolic ministry. You can have a, all sense can decide to start another branch 
and uh, you can call it a church plant, but in the context of apostolic ministry, it may not necessarily be a church plant. It is just that the people who stay along Entebbe Road have decided that instead of coming to All Saints, they meet <laughs> at a place nearer to their home. Well, you can call it a church plant, but the true sense of a church plant is that you go to a place and there is no church, there is no ministry happening there, but under the unction of the Holy Spirit, you feel you need to start a church there. It is hard work. The apostles are gifted to do that kind of ministry. They pioneer, uh, you know, workplace fellowships. The, the person joins up a workplace and, and he says, we must start a fellowship here. They pioneer home sales, you know, they build a, a, a home in Charger and all of a sudden they start a sale in Charger before there was no sale. But they are such, they have such um, an unction upon them, the apostolic office upon them, that they look for the opportunity to start a home sale in their area. So apostles, oh God help me, apostles have the greatest responsibility among the fivefold ministers to see that the church here on earth conforms to God's uh, own standards. I, I trust we are together up to that point. I'm just giving an introductory commentary on who an apostle is and how the apostles function because then our topic for today, which is conquering to advance the gospel will make more sense in reference to what Paul was doing as an apostle. All right. So an apostle is one who is sent out to exercise the various gifts of ministry he has received and developed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Actually, the apostle means the, the one sent out. So uh, like to the, to the Jews, they looked at Jesus as an apostle. They, he was sent out to them. So in a way, actually Jesus in, in his ranks operates as an apostle in a, in a, a perfect way. He, you could say he's the greatest apostle. And then his 12, he were also apostles in another rank after Jesus. But it does not mean that after the, the, the 12, you know, were off the scene, then we do not have any more apostles. No, that now we have the rank. Interruption there. I hope the admin can manage that. So we have the ranks of the, the likes of Paul. <laughs> All right. By the way, talking about apostolic ministry, let me just ask a question. When when you recite, when you recite the Nasin Creed and you say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I believe in one holy and one holy Catholic and apostolic church. What, what exactly do you mean? Or do you know what, what you say? Do you know what you mean when you say you believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church? I, I am I'm sure not many of us can expound that. Yeah, but it's important that we understand the apostolic ministry. So the person operating in this office just like we, we have seen in the case of, of Paul, and yet he's in prison. The person operating in the, uh, 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 the office of an apostle takes charge of the situation at hand, especially to advance the gospel. I personally admire this office. You know, while the pastor, the shepherd, loves to comfort and console, you know, don't expect a lot of this from an apostle. <laughs> An apostle functions differently. And I'm glad at all sense, at all sense, this office has for a long time not been occupied. The office of an apostle has for a long time at all sense not been, it has been uh, vacant. And so we have been trying to feed it by a few volunteers here and there, you know, you know, leading overnights, you know, trying to do this and that. But the office of an apostle was not fully utilized. I am so glad that in this season, this office, the office of an apostle is fully functional at All Saints Cathedral. Let me give you an example for you to understand what I'm saying. An apostle 
instead of consoling you, you know, and trying to, to pray for you and console you and comfort you, the apostle uses phrases like, eh, when they are leading prayer in a, in, a, in, a, in a church service, they use phrases like, everyone get on your feet. Lift your right hand and say, Father, deliver me from prayerlessness. Eh? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> An apostle will, will not have time to babysit you. An apostle ushers you into a place where you, you must function. So sometimes these offices seem like they are in conflict. The evangelist will not appreciate your sermon if it does not end with an altar call. Actually, if you have an evangelist seated in the congregation and you don't make an altar call at the end of your sermon, they will be disappointed. Yet, maybe the, to the teacher, as long as the congregation has understood the teaching, ah, they are happy. They may not necessarily have to make an altar call. They, they, assume, they presume that now that you have understood, you will make the right decisions. So these are different offices. Now, that brings us to uh, understanding our topic for today. And now listen to how the apostle speaks. This is uh, Paul now speaking. He says, for everyone here, this is verse 13 of uh, our, our text today, which is, uh, which is uh, Philippians chapter one. And uh, I am picking from verse 13. So verse 13, he says, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. The guy is in prison, but everyone around there has now started to understand and to know about Christ. Verse 14 and says, and because of my imprisonment, most of the believers have, have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. <laughs> now, you see, while many of us would have seen Paul's situation only in, a neg in negative terms. I mean, Paul is in prison. We could have sympathized with him and seen his situation as negative. But Paul saw it as, as, as a positive way to share the gospel, you know, with new people. So Paul demonstrated a high level, or he demonstrates to us a high level of the right attitude of, of a believer. And many of you that are listening to me this morning, I beseech thee, there is an attitude that the Lord wants us to have concerning the extension of the kingdom. The, the, the attitude of an apostle or functioning in the office of an apostle. Not all of us are going to be pastors. Not all, <laughs> not all of us are going to, to you know, hold your hands and... Uh, have a pity party with you. No. So Paul was by far a very prominent apostle. To him, trials are opportunities to advance the gospel. That's the man I'm talking about this morning. And we have a lot to learn from him uh, uh, this morning. For example, let me, let, me, let, me, let me share with you something. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in case you're writing, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse 16, up to, you know, onwards. There is, a, there is a, a way he is defending himself. Paul is defending himself. Why? There is controversy coming up in the church, the church in Corinth, and people are beginning to doubt, you know, his, uh, his, uh, his ministry and what he's doing and his uh, testimony and so on. So he writes, uh, so to say, in self-defense, all right? So some of the things he's talking about, he's saying, I, I don't want to boast. And he's saying some people boast about different things. But for him, he's boasting about a different subject altogether. So when you pick it up from, uh, from verse 21, you know, he, he, he says, but whatever they dare to boast about, I am talking like a fool again. I dare to boast about it too. It, you, you, it, you're understanding better when you pick it up from, uh, 
from the previous verses. But in the interest of time, I'm going straight to the portion I'm interested in. So he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? Then he says, I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. Now, listen to what he's talking about. I have worked under, been in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders have given me 39 lashes. Three times I, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I slept a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. This is an apostle, my friend. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many, uh, many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and I have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Shay, apostolic office. Apostolic office. It is hard to get this from, uh, anyway, let me not go there. But you see how he concludes in verse 28. He says, then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches apostolic office. He has concern. By the way, do you sometimes wonder what motivates a, you know, a priest assigned to All Saints Cathedral? That they are in a morning devotion, they attend lunch hour, they attend evening, they attend the overnight, then they are in the marriage counseling, they are all over the place, they, they attend an overnight in another church and then rush to join the overnight at All Saints do you think it's because th that person is paid more money? In your view? There is an office of an apostle. I hope by now you have already figured out what I'm talking about. There is an, there's an office of an apostle that the Lord would want us to appreciate in this season and allow that, uh, allow that, that, that ministry to function. Now, you see, uh, an apostle is very courageous, is very determined, is so daring, and I, that's the ministry that we need. He's fearless. He, he does not give up for the sake of the gospel. He's not lazy. <laughs> and, and I appeal to us on this call, I might sound crazy, but let us not be lazy. Let us not be timid. Let us not be cowards. No, that's not the apostolic way of doing things. You won't talk about conquering to advance the gospel if you're timid, <laughs> if, you're, if you're lazy. You won't identify with this message today. Now, I know the title apostle sounds more as a men's office than women. But let me tell you, we have some incredible testimonies from women as well from women, and I know our team here on this call is predominant, predominantly consists of ladies. But I can tell you, I can tell you, and I say this with uh, all due respect, I can tell you that some of these mothers that you see on this call have gone through very difficult challenges that if they narrated them to you, you would marvel, you would wonder, you would be, you would wonder the, their courage and their determination that they have pushed it to this point. You just need to talk to some of them. So the, the apostle title might sound more like a main thing. No, but forget about it. Forget about the men who posing as courageous. Actually, most men run away when someone is dying. You know that. When someone is dying, 
And that's when the men just to, to find an excuse to be away. It is the ladies who face some of, of these very scaring moments. And, and uh, <laughs> those of you who might know me more, my mother faced a lot of those situations, watching your loved ones die. Not once, not twice, not three times, but you're able to watch them die and you fold them smartly and close their eyes and the ladies can do that. It's, it's, a, it's a, a courageous uh, um, kind of uh, uh, encounter. And, and, and if you talk to some of the ladies on this call, you'll be amazed at some of the things that they have done for the sake of the kingdom. I, I, for example, know one lady, she's not here in, in our church, she's, so I, I think I can share this testimony without, uh, without contradiction. This lady, this lady, her husband ran away <laughs> to go to another woman in another country. And he stayed there for many years. And by the time the, the husband left, they only had, I think, one child. But this lady was so determined <laughs> to uphold her testimony and to build up her family. So she devised a very wise plan. She would travel to the country where the husband had, uh, had uh, <laughs> they had married him, <laughs> where the husband was. She would travel to that country. She would book a hotel or find somewhere to stay. And then she would link up with the husband. She would call up the husband to the place where she's staying. Remember, she cannot go to the other home where the other woman is. So she would stay, say, in a restaurant, in a hotel or in a place, link up with the husband, and she would stay there, say, for a month. <laughs> eh? The husband was a... Yes, he, he, the husband would still come to meet her in a... In a, in a in a place she would have booked up. And she would stay there until after conception or after, after she has conceived in a foreign land. And she would return when she, she's expecting. And that's how she managed to get additional two or three children <laughs> with the prodigal husband. <laughs> Can you imagine? So, but the whole village respected her. I too, I respect her because she did something that is not for the cowards, <laughs> but she was determined to uphold her family. You would find very interesting testimonies among the ladies uh, uh, that you see on this call. So back to our topic, conquering to advance the gospel. What Paul is saying is that my imprisonment has actually helped the gospel spread. You no, know, being thrown into prison has put the good news of Jesus on the radar of people who could have, you know, otherwise not been reached by the gospel. So today, as I speak to you, we may not necessarily be thrown into, you know, Ruzira prison, a prison, a physical prison cell. But there are many other kinds of prisons we find ourselves in. A situation around you that is more or less a prison, but just like Paul, you can turn that situation into an opportunity to advance the gospel if you have the attitude of an apostle, the attitude of, uh, oh, of Paul. Some of us, it could be a health matter, a health issue that is imprisoning you because of your state of your health, you are unable to function like many others in a way you're confined to a prison. But there are people who come to see you. So you have turned that, you know, that encounter with them as an opportunity to reach out to them. Others, it, it, it could even be a financial prison, but you have turned it round for the good. So because you, you're currently not employed, uh, and so you do not have a, a commitment to go to work on a daily basis. You have not looked at it in the negative. Rather, you have said for as long as I have this time, I would be more involved in ministry. And you're doing exactly that. May God bless you and bless you abundantly. And, and there are many other prisons that uh, you could find yourself in, 
but God can turn those situations uh, as opportunities to advance the gospel. Uh, sometimes it's false accusation. You know, people accuse you falsely, but you stand your ground. And by the time the truth comes out, oh, it has had a toll on you. But then when the truth comes out, it glorifies God. Uh, it, and, and so on. There are so many things that happen. So how, how have you uh, how have you used your being in your whatever prison you might you might say you're in how have you used it to advance the gospel of christ you know many of us would play victim you play victim uh, mentality where you act as though what has been done is unfair to you and so for that matter you will not be able to function but we notice the attitude of paul is different the attitude of an apostle is different. Now, let me bring in another apostle so that you, you get a contrast of what I'm talking about. There is another apostle called Peter. Uh, and and uh, you find this in Acts chapter 5. Uh, I know our time runs very fast. But in Acts chapter 5 from verse 26, it narrates, it brings out a story where Peter and his friends were uh, had to appear before before the high priest. Now, I will just read bits and pieces. Verse twenty seven of Acts chapter five. Uh, verse twenty seven says, "Then they brought the apostles before the high council, where the high priest confronted them." This is what he says in verse twenty eight. The the high priest. He said, we gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. He said, instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him. And you want to make us responsible for his death. You know, the high priest is charging at them. Verse 29 says, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the, in the place of honor at his right hand as priest and savior. He did so. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those who obey him. Apostolic ministry. You hear that? You hear? Verse 33 says, when they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. <laughs> eh? Very bold uh, apostles here. But now uh, someone is charging and threatening to kill them. I will, may not read the whole thing. But verse 40 at the end, it says, you know, after they have discussed between them, they, they you know they chased the Peters out and then the council, you know, met and decided on the way forward. So after they had agreed on the way forward, verse 40 says, they called in the apostles and had them flogged. <laughs> they called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. But something very interesting happens after that verse. Verse 41, it says, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, God. This, this, this attitude is dying out. I do not know why we do not want the office of an apostle to function. It is a powerful office, I tell you. It is a powerful office. And, and, and uh, I thank God that in this season, this office is being revived. Someone looking at a very, what you would consider a negative situation, but they are looking at it positively for the sake of the gospel. Now, if me and you, if we are still failing on very simple tests, very simple, very simple, as simple as, let me tell you, that I, I changed jobs recently. And uh, when I was filling in the new employer's form, in that form, 
they, there's a question that, do you have a relative in this company? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> so as I was filling this form, I, I didn't want to declare that I have any relatives in this company, just in case it is used against me. But as I was still fidgeting with this question, I had as if I had the Holy Spirit challenge me and say, now, surely, this is a very simple question. Eh? Do you have any relatives in this company? You know you have them. Why don't you say yes? It, I mean, is that too hard? <laughs> and oh my God, it was so clear that I had to take yes and even state who my relative was. Otherwise, if I, I concealed that, I would have created a, a crack in my foundation in this new employment. And then you get to insurance, an insurance form. Now, when they're assessing you for insurance, there's a form you fill in. And depending on how much risk you state, it might have implications on the kind of insurance package you will have. So they ask you a question like, have you ever undergone any you know, surgical operation or, or surgery or surgical procedure? Yes or no? And <laughs> guess what? Many of us, because we want insurance not to ask us many questions, even when you have had the operation, you will take no. So that, you know, because when you take yes, they, they ask you for details now. They give you a full space to specify the details of how the procedure was and where it was and when it was, when it was etc, etc. But there are simple tests, simple things like signing in a register at your place of work. Hey, hey. The, 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 the cutoff time for signing in is eight. But, oh God, I can see many of you, <laughs> many of you might fall in this trap. Now, when you come in eight, I mean, uh, 20, 10 minutes past eight, it looks so odd that you can be honest enough to write on the register that you know is going to be used to appraise you, to write that on, on, on Friday, 20th Jan, 2023, I came into office at 8.30. It is so hard, I tell you. Yes, it is a simple test to say, are you able to pass this test? Can you state that you came in at, at 8.30? So now, if we fail the, the tests as small as this, all right, how do we expect to conquer, to advance the gospel? It's a challenge I bring to you and to myself. If we want to function to the level of Paul, you know, and every opportunity, everything that happens to us, we advance the gospel powerfully, conquering. That's the language of an apostle. Yet the basic simple tests are challenging us. How would we compare? There's a category as, a, as, a, as I try to maximize my time. There's a category of people I would want us to compare with. How do we compare with what Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 uh, writes about from uh, verse 30, around 32? It, it says, and what more shall I say? Verse 32 of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. It says, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson. And, and the whole list of other people and the prophets, you know, who conquered, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised. And it lists, you know, several things that some of them had to go through and to endure. But in the interest of time, uh, if you pick it up from verse 35, it says, women received back their dead, raised to life again. You know, powerful things that the apostles were doing. It says, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they, may, they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging 
and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goat skin, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. But you see how this ends. He says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect, the body of Christ, that we join up all together to be made perfect as a body of Christ. Yet some of them have had to endure more, more challenging moments than what some of us are, are, are experiencing. So the conquering to advance the gospel, I, I, I summon you, I appeal to you, is not for the faint-hearted, is not for the kind of people who are lazy, it's not for the kind of people who give excuses at every moment, it's not for the kind of, of, of ministry and attitude that is uh, of weaklings, no, no, that, that has its space, and let me tell you, you don't expect every morning that whoever comes to speak here is a pastor, with a word of encouragement oh. or is a prophet who is, by the way, some prophets, the, the apostolic and prophetic, they normally move together. And sometimes their words don't sound kind. And sometimes they are misunderstood. They think, people think they are proud. People think they, they show off. People think they, 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 they have this better than thou attitude. <laughs> but everyone has their place. If the, an evangelist, if you bring an evangelist, for example, to speak in an overnight, now you know in an overnight, mainly people who come for an overnight have such a, uh, have a degree of a relationship with Christ. That's why they would come for an overnight. Yes, there are those who would come in and they don't know the Lord. But for an evangelist, uh, you, you would disappoint them because they will speak a word of salvation to the converted. And when they make an altar call at, at three in the night and they don't get a catch, they feel like their effort was misappropriated. But call an apostle. Oh, oh call an apostle for a night because the apostle's role is different. He equips people so that they do it themselves. Instead of, of laboring to, to, to pray for them, he tells them what to pray about and then commands them and say, pray. <laughs> and when they are dozing, he says, wake up and pray an apostle. The pastor will, will do something different. And these offices are fully functional now at All Saints Cathedral. So what are we saying? God is releasing grace in this season and he's releasing grace to function in the office of an apostle, the office of a church planter, the office of a pioneer. Can you start a fellowship? Can you lead an overnight? Do you have that action? Are you able to to do what others think is hard. Because now what happens in the church when we get one who functions in this ministry, this apostolic, we wear them out. They will call them to lead the overnight in and out. And, and the man is weary. But thank God for this apostolic office. You will, you will invite someone. Uh, okay, I don't like mentioning names. But let me mention one for, for, for this uh, illustration. Sometimes you would invite, say, Reverend Medad Virunji Biyesu. And Medad Virunji Biyesu will come to the stage to speak at midnight. But when he starts to speak at midnight, he tells you, we have just arrived from Untungamo. <laughs> We had a powerful time in Ntongamo and we left this, uh, this afternoon at two. And so I have just arrived from Ntongamo, but I am here for the sake of, oh my God, what level of grace is that? That the man has been in the field, 
He's driven all through the afternoon. It is now midnight. He has possibly not reached home and he's on the altar for the overnight. And he will take you on up to morning. That is apostolic, my friend. You won't find that in, in some of the offices. And so that is the degree that Paul was functioning at. That's the degree that God is calling us to, the ability to conquer, to extend the kingdom. And, 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 and if, we are, if we think it is going to be the bed of roses, it's going to be you know, good Zoom that you put on and cover yourself uh, with a blanket and the, 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 the preaching ends when you're already asleep, only to wake up and it has ended. Oh my God, it won't work like that. So I summon you, I appeal to you, please come through. The apostolic ministry is now fully functional at All Saints Cathedral and in many other places. And there's grace for us to function in it. So whether it takes prayer, whether it takes stepping forward and, and, and getting things done, this must happen and it must happen in this season. It shouldn't be a few people. No, the Lord is calling many of us that should be able to jump in and advance the kingdom in the apostolic office. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I must, uh, I must end here so that we give time for people to pray. But uh, my appeal is that if you think, you, if, you, if your calling is being evangel an evangelist, please function as such. If yours is to be a teacher, then report for duty, function as a teacher. And, 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 and for some of us, if you're looking for a pastor, we may disappoint you. We may not be the pastor. But maybe if you're looking for an apostle or an apostolic office or someone who functions in that line or in the prophetic line, you might find that. You might find some people. Yeah, but if you expect all of them, hallelujah, let me not uh, go far. Thank you very much. This morning, I feel there is a stirring up in the spirit that you, you take the example of our sister. I hope she's on the call today. Our sister, Joy. Joy, uh, uh, your surname is running away. You know, she had gone to preach the gospel at CPS and boom, the bomb goes off and she was uh, affected. You would think she would now be so scared to participate in anything evangelistic, but not joy. Joy, I salute you this morning, and the Lord is calling us to operate in that kind of, of anointing. <laughs> I hand over to Maureen for purposes of prayer and uh, further closure. God bless you. Amen. Amen. And amen. We thank the Lord for the message that we have received. Thank you, our brother Peter. Friends, we have had the message. Yes, we have heard the message. It is upon us now to go out and preach the gospel. It is upon us. And so we are going to respond briefly to the message because our time is first spent and I'll invite the Levite to close us in prayer, to close us off. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the message that we have received this morning through your servant. Thank you for calling us back to you to evangelize, Father. Thank you that you've reminded us that you've given us all what we need. You've equipped us for all that we need for the, for, for, for the sake of your kingdom. My master, we say thank you this morning for such a message in such a moment, that's in such a season. Lord, we do not take it for granted, but we choose to come back to you to say thank you. Thank you for having used our brother Peter to bring to us the message. Thank you for his life. Thank you for nurturing him. Thank you for what you've put in him that we too may benefit out of that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And so friends, we have heard the message. We have heard the word. We have heard it from our Lord Jesus Christ through Peter. And so the onus is on us to go out. We have been equipped, the Lord equips us daily through our daily prayer times as individuals, first and as a church, as fellowships, the Lord has equipped us. Maybe some of us, some of us have not given into the call. Some of us have not reported for duty and yet we know that we are called. Friends, it is 
such a time that we are going to meditate through this message that we have received, that we are going to meditate. And yes, we return, we return back to our God. Father, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, where we have not obeyed you, where we have first given to the things of the world that we are still finalizing, Father, have mercy on us. But this morning, we choose to say that we are reporting back for duty in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My Lord and my Father, will you equip us afresh? Will you equip us again? Fill us with your power. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, my Lord. Fill us with wisdom. Fill us with understanding, Lord. Oh, Father, you say you do not want, want, you do not want any soul to perish, but you want all of us for you. Lord, we ask that you'll feel us, that as we move out even this morning, as we go to our workplaces, wherever we are going this morning, that, Father, they will see you in us, that we shall evangelize, that we shall use the gifts that you've given us, that you shall use all that you've filled us with for the advancement of your kingdom. Father, not for us, but for you, Jesus for you alone, for you alone, Lord. And we ask that you take all the glory, you take all the honor, take all the praise. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.